Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name's Jason Newland and this is Let Me Bore You to Sleep. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes as this boring recording that's specifically aimed at boring you to sleep may cause drowsiness Um, normally before I start I give a little I normally mention something about what's going on Uh, any new developments Uh, I'm tired oh Yeah, check out my website. All my stuff's on there. All my recordings. All my videos. And there's a testimonial page where you can read other people's testimonials. People that have written nice things about me. And you can leave your own testimonial as well, if you wish. And... Yeah, so, and there's a gift me page on there if you want to visit that. If you want to send me a gift, that would be lovely. Um, so, what I've got in front of me, in my hand, or both hands actually, it takes two hands to hold this thing, um, is the Collins Gem Geography Basic Facts. <laughs> for exam revision a mine of information it looks really old not the um, the inside is but just I'm going to look at the age of it 1983 it was originally published and this is this copy is the fifth edition from 2002 um, I used to have these uh, little books kind of similar kind of things but they were for what kind of things are they for because let's face it, we're going back to my kind of era of when I would buy stuff like this, like the early 80s. Um, books on, actually it probably wasn't the same thing, but like how to be a private detective and and what other things. I'm trying to think. It'd be things like astronomy, like astrology. Yeah, you know, about planets and uh, whatever, um, like planes. You know, the guide to planes and guides to mountains, mountain, mountains, and guide. You know, different things like that. But perhaps it wasn't the Collins. It might have been a different kind of publisher because this looks very much more um, studious. Is that an actual word? So, <clears throat> on the inside, still got the remainder of the cough that I had for the last uh, 10 days or so, but it's calmed down now, luckily. Flares up a little bit when I'm talking, but occasionally I have to put it on pause. I have a big old cough I go and then I'm fine again on the inside it says uh, some other gems that might interest you business studies basic facts now wouldn't that be interesting I suppose if it was reissued that update it but the original version let's say it's 1983 
business studies, you wouldn't have any mention of the internet. No mention of Facebook, no mention of YouTube, Amazon, iPhones, smartphones, anything like that. It'd be computers, of course. I mean, uh, 1983, there was computers around, but no internet. Modern history, basic facts. That's another one. Imagine 1983, modern history, basic facts. It wouldn't be quite so modern anymore, would it? I mean, there'd be no... Wow, I think that some of the political figures, you know, in the, well, in, in, in this country where I currently abode or abide, um, what have we had? Since 1983. What was his name? I don't know, some Prime Minister after Thatcher. Um, John Major, that's it, Major. So we had Major, Prime Minister, and then... Then... Was he the Prime Minister all the way up to Tony Blair? John must have been, mustn't he? I don't th did anyone take over from John Major? I don't remember. John Major? No, I don't think they did. So Tony Blair was a Prime Minister from 97, 1997, till, I say that because you might be listening to this in 30, 39. You know what I mean? So it could be, oh. Hundreds of years from now, might have found it in a volcano somewhere. Might have found this and found our way to play it. And uh, maybe someone made a to put on a vinyl or something. I could do that, you know. I could put some of my stuff on vinyl and sell it on vinyl. What a pointless waste of time. But it could be cool. It, some people might like that. I could make some, like, real world physical, like, things you can hold in your hands and collect kind of stuff. So I put stuff on, uh, on tape. I don't remember the old tapes. Or on vinyl or on CD and just have those for people to buy if they want and you could have a physical library with my little name on it Yee. so you got uh, John Major Tony Blair and then Tony Blair and we had Brown who took over from Tony Blair after being the Chancellor I think he was and uh, after he gave free prescriptions and uh, free made sure that where he comes from has free prescriptions what else free um, you know no student loans like free education and uh, England who he was in charge of the uh, student loans I'm not sure when they came in because 
I know people that went through the whole of education from leaving school to going and doing their A-levels for, what, two years, and then going and doing their undergraduate degree for three years, then doing a master's degree, maybe for one year, and then going on and doing a PhD for perhaps another two years. And they didn't have to pay a penny, didn't have to get in debt or anything like that, because it was all free, free education. And not anymore. It's quite weird because when I left university, my I was in a meet, well, not a meeting, but I was having a chat with my the leader of the course, and he said, "You're lucky." I said, "I don't really know where you get that from. How do you figure that out?" He said, "No, you are. You're lucky." I said, "Okay, go on then." But he said, "Well, you realise that you're leaving college or you know, university this year, 2010." I said yeah I know the year and he said well next year the student um, fees are going to go up I said what he said yeah the government have been uh, was it supporting or subsidising the fees and now they're not going to do it anymore and the students are going to get charged the full amount of fees. So instead of being £3,000 a year, it went up to, I think initially it went up to 6000 and now it's 9000 But I might, I might be on, you know, it's definitely about 9000 now anyway. But I'm not sure if it went up in increments or just went up straight away to the full 9000 a year. It's a lot of money. So for, for one year, they're paying the amount that I cost me for three years for my degree. It'd be lovely if it was free. Because... I'll just have a little skim through this geography, ba geography basic facts. I can't think of a more boring convers. Oh, geography. Wow, look at this, look at this. Climate change from 1983. Okay, what does it say? Fluctuations in the patterns of climate over long periods of time. That's what climate change means. There is indisputable evidence for changes in the world's climate. A. Fossil records. Fossils of species such as the mammoth have been found in what are now temperature regions. And B. Topographical evidence in North Africa, now largely desert, it can be seen where rivers once ran, indicating that the area's rainfall was once much higher. You know, I just realised, just realised this. I nearly said the now largely deserted, but it's not, it's desert. And that's just realised where it's deserted comes from. Because deserted means not many people being there, doesn't it? Like quite an empty space. And a desert is quite an empty space, isn't it? So, a desert 
apart from being ice cream and chocolate and marshmallows. But a desert is a deserted place. I wonder if anyone else has realised that. Connection. C. Historical records. So it says here, the freezing over the River Thames was widely reported in the 17th and 18th centuries. And it says here, see Little Ice Age. Okay, doesn't say any more there. So that, so they're saying, what are they saying? Because it, the, the River Thames doesn't freeze over, it means that we're, but we don't want the River Thames to freeze over, do we? Hmm? Met and, and D, it says here, meteorological records. So, uh, records of the weather which exist for many areas of the world and some of which date from early times. Records of the weather which exist. Okay, comparisons can be made with present day climate. Uh, I'm lost on that one. There's a bunch of words. E, geological evidence. The landscape of, for example, much of Britain has been shaped by the action of glaciers and then it says see ice age it really wants me to read ice age just put it uh, I just remember the glacier do you remember the um, the advert Fox's Glacier Mints and it had a little uh, not, not a pumpkin um, polar bear it was a polar bear and it would didn't it like bang into it and say ouch ouch and glacier mints polar bears are stupid well I don't know what the, the catchphrase was but it's um, I actually met the man that made that advert he was an NLP uh, teacher, quite a big name in the NLP world, and he he was responsible for that advert. Because believe believe it or not, this is a, this is a little bit of a fact that you might not be interested in. When hypnosis, um, there's there's different times during history that hypnosis has taken on quite a big um, it's made a bit of fuss of you know it's been taken seriously one of those times was during uh, when it was used for pain relief before the medical uh, profession had a way to anaesthetize people as it was used, hypnosis was used for that because studies had been done and um, medical doctors went to other countries and did thousands of operations, wrote books and medical papers and everything uh, using only hypnosis and of course the medical procedure. So doctors in I would say the Western world, I don't know how far sprung it was. It might have just been in the UK, it might have been in Europe, I don't know. It might have been in America. I don't really care. Um, but I know that it was used, hypnosis was used for um, helping people 
It's like for a for anaesthetist, for anaesthetizing people during operations. And then ether came in, that became available, or it was discovered, or created, or invented, or whatever. And as soon as that was available, the doctors, the surgeons started using that instead of hypnosis. Because it's much quicker. It's much quicker, it's easy. It was just a chemical, wasn't it? And it's and it did the job. And if I had a choice between having an operation with hypnosis or with medical anaesthetizing, I'd go for the medical, the chemical, the drug anaesthetist. That's what I'd go for. So I was knocked out completely. Um, I don't want someone like me waffling on. So that was a big time in the past. Another big one that isn't quite as uh, known and uh, it's quite not quite as written about, although I've, I have read things about it, articles, and I have in the past had a very large hypnosis uh, library. So I used to have quite a few, you know, old books that used to talk about this. A a place that really, or an institute that really took hypnosis to their bosom was advertising really took it to their bosom they they breastfed it you know they made they made it made a, it was a cash cow for them and they used it used the hypnosis techniques um, in order to manipulate the masses through television and radio advertising. Isn't that interesting? And during the Brexit uh, thing that we don't like to talk about really, but it's a made up word. And uh, a very famous hypnotist was called in and used by one of the parties during the uh, period of trying to get or trying to manipulate the population of England or Britain or whatever to vote uh, to you know leave and stuff isn't that interesting yeah it's not really is it not very interesting it amazes me. It's, there was one, one study, and see, some people think, right, I have a drink of Coke, I'm going to give a lecture, and I'm going to give you a lecture. The lecturer is going to give a lecture. Now, hypnosis. Is about the result rather than the the way it's presented maybe I don't know so you don't have to talk and uh, tell someone you're gonna feel this you're gonna feel that and this is gonna happen and that's gonna happen and then man, man, man. Of course it, that works, but it doesn't, it's not the only way that works. And you don't have to um, start shaking someone really quickly and pull their head down in order for them to go into some instant hypnotic trance. Of course, that works. But if someone grabbed my head like that, I wouldn't be too happy. Um, and also, because I'm, I'm a bit of a, I don't know what the right word is, careful in some, t in some ways, quite a careful person. 
Um, if I had someone there, first of all, if I think the only way, <laughs> this is a personal thing, if you're going to do a demonstration, instant um, induction, I think the only place really for that kind of thing would be on stage as a performance. And I would be a little bit concerned about the person's neck because a neck can be quite a, I don't know, my neck's a little bit delicate at times. And someone just to push down on my neck would be, or just to push me down and say, oh, I don't know if I enjoy that. That don't feel too comfortable. Oh my goodness, I've got the television on. And the first Christmas advert has just popped on the telly. Oh dear. It's for Disney World, probably Paris. That's for, um, I've never been, but I've got no idea what it's like. But it's, I imagine it's just an easier um, route to do, isn't it? It's rather than traveling all the way to Orlando. See, I do know my geography. I know that Disney World is in Orlando. I think. It is, isn't it? Orlando. I think. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. So, I... Yeah, there was this study done. It was more of a psychological study. However, it was using hypnosis. Basically, suggestion. So what they did is, it was done in Mexico. And this is, I'm not sure what year this was. I studied this as part of an open university course I was doing on psychology. So I don't have the exact details. Um, but the what they did I think it was in Mexico it's, it was in in America some part of America and um, I don't abide by continents I don't as far as I'm concerned it's one country sorry sorry to break it to you that's why <laughs> that's why my friend sent me this geography basic facts because as far as, as far as I'm concerned, one continent, one country. Don't do continents. You can't. One country. How can there be a border unless there's a sea? It has to be sea around it for it to be an island. An island's an island. However big it is, it's surrounded by sea, isn't it? So, you know, just all we'll get along. Let's all get along, shall we? <laughs> And I think it was Mexico, it might have been Puerto Rico, or it might have been, um, I don't know, Mexico, or, or um, Germany, I'm not sure, I can't remember, Brazil, Brazil, that's another one, isn't it, that's up that way, Brazil. That's, that's part of America, isn't it? Um, or Chelsea. I, I don't know. But anyway, I think it was in Mexico. And they did this study where there was, they wanted to reduce the amount of teenage pregnancies. That was their goal. Because it was for whatever reason they, they felt it was a bit too high and they wanted to find out a way to uh, cut it to reduce it and they tried things by just saying can you please or use a rubber please use a Johnny and that wasn't working so they tried a different version so what they did is on the country's biggest soap opera television show they had they devised a plot. So 
they got together with the sh TV show's producers and together they devised a plot that had the leading character um, go through um, a very go through that, that situation of getting pregnant as a teenager, underage or whatever mm -hmm. and the parody is true and they did all this and it, it had such a big effect that the teenage pregnancy rate went down by a huge amount the sales of condoms went up by a huge amount now that is hypnosis And because it's planned to get a result and it's manipulation. Because anyone that says hypnosis isn't manipulation is we're always manipulating each other, even if we don't mean to, be, to do. You know, not, not necessarily intentionally manipulating each other, but we affect each other, don't we? All of us you talk to somebody I'm very very um, easily influenced ridiculous sometimes which is why I quite like to keep away from people because I find and it's, it's silly I know it's silly but um, I can be swayed by another person's opinion not opinion as in um in the sense of me believing what they think, but as in it's in their mood, you know, kind of just I don't know. I think it's because I listen. I listen, I listen too much. <laughs> That's my problem. I just I'm too attentive. <laughs> so. Um, I think that this Gibraltar exercise on that, you know, soap opera or whatever it was, is a really good exam example, it's a really good example of mass hypnosis, manipulation, but with a, um, do you want to, should we say positive intent or a kind intent uh, trying to you know to help the population possibly some would say well you know they have arguments about it and I don't really care um, what those arguments would be it's I do find it interesting though when you think about the people have this conception that hypnosis is either ordering people around on a stage and getting them to do silly things or somebody sitting in a chair talking and then just saying you're going to feel this, you're going to feel that and, blah, 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 blah. and both of them are hypnosis it's true, they are but there's more to it than that. Does that make sense? See, I, I'm in a different kind of camp. Some people, I'm very camp. Some people say, you know, stage hypnosis is just rubbish. Some people say there's no such thing as counselling, just rubbish. Psychotherapy is silly. And they all kind of want to, they want to promote their own thing. You know, counselling is silly, but hypnosis is brilliant. Hypnosis is silly, but counselling is brilliant. Stage hypnosis is brilliant, but therapy is just silly. You know, they, you know, it's, everyone's got their own thing. I'm kind of open to all of them. Generally, don't care. I think if something works, it works. If you sat here listening to me, going. 
Boom, bing, bam, boom, bam. Beepity, boo, bam, bam, be down, boom, boom. Beepity, be, boom, boom, bam, ba, boom, bam. For an hour. And at the end of it, you felt different. You felt. more uplifted, you know, whatever, if something had changed, and you felt better about yourself, then that's, that's, that's worked. It's kind of a weird, weird thing to do, possibly. And don't worry, I'm never going to do a recording like that. Beam, bam, boom, 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 bam, boom. I kind of want to now. Boom, beam, bam, boom. I suppose I could do something like this, like I could talk, bim bam, ba doom boom, about how I'm feeling, boom a dee moo, bee bee dee bee dee bee dee bee, buck oh buck rogers, me bee dee bee bee, okay buck, me 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 me, I could do that in a talk in a really, really kind of suave way, how are you today, bee dee bee bam, Baba doom boom, Baba de ba ba, Baba doom boom. I went for a walk down the street. Be be, be de be, be de be de be 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 be. And I looked up at a tree. Wee 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 wee. And I thought to myself, Ba ba ba, Ba da ba ba. Where are all these? Sounds coming from Bidi 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 And then I carried on walking And I could do something like that but I won't because it is clearly a little bit shitty and if I'm known for anything, I'm known for my seriousness. I'm a very, very serious person that takes everything very, very seriously. And I have no time for humor, no time for laughter. It's all about seriousness. Because the only way to heal from any kind of emotional turmoil is by being incredibly serious all the time. Or is it the opposite to that? Mm, let me think. <clears throat> yes. I think um, to take yourself seriously, like taking yourself too seriously, thinking that that will improve your life, is almost like trying to push on a door that opens outwardly. Keep pushing at that door, it's gonna open eventually. But it won't ever open because you have to pull it. You gotta pull it. But no, you're pushing. It's like it's pull it. Why do you think it's got a knob on it? It's got a knob, it's got a handle to pull. No, I'm gonna keep pushing. Pushing, pushing. I'm seriously gonna focus on that pushing. So each to their own. I've seen some serious people over the years and taking themselves so seriously. And I've done it myself. I have. And it doesn't happen too often, thankfully. But it has happened. It really has happened a couple of times. And I kind of don't like myself afterwards. It's a little bit of guilt, you know. Probably uh, stems from the old days when I used to. No, oh, what's this? Uh, Star Trek's on the telly. It's the Deep Space Nine, I think. It might be Voyager. I think it's Voyager. Because what you had normal Star Trek, like the original series, that they show, they show that hit on telly as well. 
and it might sound weird but I actually really like the original series more than I have done for a long long time admittedly I haven't watched it for a long long time but there's there's something quite good about it I, I know it was brilliant at the time okay um, but it can be, it can be a little bit difficult watching something that's so dated um, where you know sort of where the special effects are just you know it's, it can be a little bit difficult re-watching stuff like that a little bit but Star Trek has something about it that was beautiful it's I don't know if it's the dialogue it was funny the dialogue and the, the put downs and the conversations they had with each other was it was really good because let's face it they couldn't rely on a huge amount of special effects I mean they I suppose they did they probably created special effects specifically for Star Trek because it was a it was like a new thing wasn't it but I just like it I don't watch it much but watched it the other day and it was just I don't know it was good and then in the 90s well I, I used to watch Star Trek the original TV show um, when I was a kid my memory my first memory of it was in the early 80s because you know I wasn't even alive when Star Trek was originally broadcasted and I, th I started watching it it might have been late 70s but early 80s I remember it used to be on I don't know why I've got this in my head but it used to be on maybe 5.30 or 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the evening on BBC Two, I think, and I'm pretty sure BBC Two. And then I thought I used to watch it, and I really liked it. I really liked it, really a lot, really did. And then I started watching the Star Trek films, which were very different from the TV show. I mean, firstly, it was weird because I didn't realize that Star Trek was such a long time ago so I'm watching it 20 years after it had originally been on telly and then I watch Star Trek the film and I see Captain Kirk and Spock and um, Scotty and Subaru um, and Sulu and the Russian um, Chekhov that's it, Chekhov I think I knew said jerk off, check off, that's it, check off. And um, they were all old. And bearing in mind, I was only, you know, 12 or whatever, 10, 11. And they were all old compared to what they were in the TV show. But they were, they were 20 years older. They were all like in their 40s or 50s by this point. Uh huh. How could they have aged so much since last week? I couldn't believe it. Seriously, I watched it last week. Then I saw the film on the, mo on the, the video. Because my dad had a video recorder. And I was like, eh? Uh? He's expanded. You know, Captain Kirk, he'd grown a bit. 
but uh, that was really big. You know, the, all the films they were huge successes. Search for Spock, Wrath of Khan, The Journey Home, and I don't remember the others. One had a whale in it, didn't they? They had a whale of a time. <laughs> and then the 90s came. The new Star Trek. I was having none of it. I refused point blank range to not ever watch that program ever. It got loads of publicity when it first came out. I think one of the things was they had a captain with a French name and a bald head. I think that was a bit of a shock to the uh, to the public. Just like that's not how's that going to work. John Luc Picard and he's bald. The fact that the original Captain Kirk's been bald for the last 50 years apparently shouldn't really make any difference anyway. And then I moved to Ireland and uh, I was there for a couple of months living with Andre's parents. Not Andre here because that would be weird living in a, otherwise I'd be living in a field in a hole somewhere wouldn't I? With a bunch of ferrets, which would be very strange. <laughs> and um, Star Trek: The Next Generation was on every single night at six o'clock, or I think it was on at six thirty, or it might be on at five. But anyway, it was on the same time on Sky One every single evening of the week. And me and Andre would be sitting there watching The Simpsons. And then I think Star Trek would come on. I don't think we ever got to watch the whole thing because his mum would shout out, Dinner! And so, well, in an Irish accent, so, but it was food, it was dinner. Dinner time, come on. And so we'd all go and have something to eat. And I fell in love with Star Trek, The Next Generation, because it really was good, really good. And then from when I moved back to England, I, um, I carried on watching it, and it was on like normal telly at that point, and I just, yeah, it was brilliant. But after watching that, I couldn't watch the original show anymore, the original series. But it's only recently that I've started watching it and thinking, oh. And then the same thing happened with Star Trek. Um, what did I say? Not Deep Space Nine, but Star Trek. get it now I was just watching it but again I wouldn't watch this one not just because I thought I can't I can't do it again I can't make a new change to my life so this one was a new captain this time a female captain and with a doctor who was like an anagram, or you know, it wasn't real, and there was it was just like a, a really different Voyager, a Star Trek Voyager. But then I did, I kind of dipped my toe in one day and I thought, okay, I loved it. So I watched every episode of that. And Deep Space Nine came along. And I thought, no, nope, I've had enough now. I can't, I can't keep watching. And it's just, no, this is silly. This time, it's a different captain, but it's part of a space station. So there's, and they've got these different characters that's got a, it was like this real um, dodgy character that I think he works on the bar 
but he's always like trying to do deals and stuff and there's one of the people who work is um, he morphs into different things and oh, oh okay I'm not going to watch it refused until I watched it and I loved it and so I watched that then Star Trek I can't even remember the name of it but I stuck to my guns with this one and I didn't watch it and it was the one with uh, the time traveller man he was in it Scott Beckett or whatever his name is and I just I watched one episode and I thought oh, just didn't feel it with that one and I didn't bother and I thought I'm glad I got rid of the habit I've broken the chain never need to go back to Star Trek again then what happened a new Star Trek started a couple of years ago and I thought I'm not going to watch it I'm not going to watch it it's like every time they change, they add a new dimension, make it a bit more um, up to date or a bit more. So first of all, they had a Captain with, um, yeah, in the 60s, so they had a Captain, but they had big characters that were Russian. In the 60s, they have a Russian character, especially with the Cold War and all that stuff, which is quite... Um, brave I suppose for television to do so one of the major characters was Scottish I don't know if that really means anything but um, another one was the Ahura so a black lady in a job of like a high position job which was you know in, in the 60s was something that went against uh, the the national psyche or something I suppose and then next Star Trek they got a bald man I don't know if that really was a statement it's, it's, but he was he was elderly he was like older and that and I think it's always been an a for a long time you know, society has been ageist, so they kind of had an elderly man as an action man. Because the only elderly people who were ever doing action films or anything was James Bond, basically with with uh, Roger Moore. He was ninety and he was running around and on ski lifts and ski lifts, ski lifts, and doing somersaults and. You know, he'd he'd have bro he'd have broken his hip. You know, that's the fact of it. Um, but he, outside of that, he didn't usually see many older people doing stuff like that anymore. Anyway, but suddenly he was there, and he was intellectual. He was clever, and he he used to talk about Shakespeare and poetry and stuff like that. And he had a Klingon as a security chief, a Klingon. That goat, that goat went against everything to do with Star Trek. You can't have a Klingon working on the ship. What on earth is that about? And uh, what other things were different? Oh, there was an android, wasn't there? Again, another ca main character. A data and he was an android another thing that was just quirky it was brilliant data was brilliant and I think all I just loved all the characters on there Whoopi Goldberg was on there I'm not sure why but she, she was on there what if they realized the thing is she's so famous isn't she and everyone loves her I don't think she might have just walked on the set and they just thought 
Well, she sat down and she's drinking a cup of coffee. And she keeps telling each other people their fortunes, so I'll just leave it there. I don't want to be rude. So I think that's, I mean, she might just, maybe she's waiting for um, the third Nun film to be starting, I don't know. So they just left her there. So they're the third Star Trek, which has got a female lead, a female, and so she's a lesbian. And it's like that was that broke a lot of taboos, social taboos, female, and uh, they kind of touched on s a sexuality, which is like, eh, like everyone gets excited about. And it's like brilliant, good for them. And as I said, the doctor was, um, what's it, uh, like a, a not a hallucination, but wasn't real and what other characters was there on there Morph was Morph on that one yeah Morph a morphing person and there, if I'm correct there was a female Klingon or was there no a female um A female Spock was on there as well. No, no. Well, she might have been as well, but they broke the rules again. So the second Star Trek had a Klingon that was breaking the rules. Klingon, biggest enemy of Star Trek up to that point. But then, what did the third Star Trek do? They had. Was it nine to one or nine, seven to three or whatever? They had Star Trek's biggest enemy ever on board as part of the um, crew. Seven of nine or something like that, I forget her name, but she was part of the Borg, Bjorn, Bjorn thing where it was like a cube and it'd go through space and it used to absorb the different technology and they'd all communicate with each other. A bit like um, teenagers, I suppose. And the, she, I don't know, she left the colony or got found or whatever and she joined the ship. So that was another like, wow. So they've got a female in charge, which they'd never had before, and they had uh, the biggest enemy they've ever had, the Borg, because they could never defeat it, on the ship as well. And in Deep Space Nine, they have a black man in charge of the whole space station. Can you imagine if they'd done that in the 60s? And oh, I'm trying to think what other things I had on Deep Space Nine. I know it was great, I just can't remember. It was more going on, there was more characters. And the fact that they, you know, again, he was gay as well, I think. So, or no, he might have just drunk tea. I can't remember. I don't know what other things are on there. It's going to come to me in a minute. Was there any androids? Maybe the Morph. The Morph Man was on Deep Space Nine. Possible. The thing is, what I can't, under, what I don't really understand is the um, oh, what are they pasty heads? What are they called? The remember the Wrath of Khan. 
the um, oh, what are they called? Not gremlins. Um, 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 the biggest enemies in the past before the Bjork came along. I don't remember. No, I can't remember. But anyway, they're in Star Trek, the original show. They're in the movies. They're in every single Star Trek. Every remake of Star Trek, whether it's the Voyager, uh, Next Generation, the... Um, Deep Space Nine, the whatever the other two as well, that the newer ones, they always look different. They always have different faces. I'm not saying that everything should look all the same, but they look different. The well, I can't think of the name of them. Klingons, that's it. The Klingons, they transformed so much, but then in deep in in next generation, big old pasty head. And whenever other ones came on, they'd always look similar. They'd, be, they'd look different, but they all look similar. All have the same kind of shaped head, and you know all that stuff. But then, in each episode, each new, new retake, they look different. They make your mind up. But you know, that's just me. So I finished the geography book. I think I've given you lots and lots of new information. Um. I just read something about industrial inertia. The tendency for an industry to retain original locations, even though such locations may no longer be optimum. It's listing a bunch of them here in England. And from the looks of it, they're not there anymore. Wow. So that's the end of this recording. Thank you for listening. Hopefully. <sighs> Hopefully I'll make a deep sleep whisper soon as well and try and do some other stuff as well. But I'm just, as I come out of this, uh, the last week or so of being a bit under the weather, but I think it is the weather, you know. It's been very, it's very windy today. Even windier than me. So I'm going to go. Thank you for listening. Remember to be kind to yourself. Because you deserve to be happy. Lots of love. Bye. <laughs>